All right, Debbie. We're Proverbs 3 is 11 is where we're going to start. And um, like I said, I'm going to talk about some of them. Some of them we're just going to read and jump on unless you guys have some thoughts. And I got amplified, so it's going to have more words than yours. So if there's one, I'm learning with Harold and Joel on, on Wednesday night. If there's one I kind of want to talk about, I'm going to get one of you guys to read it. It just seems like it makes it a little easier because Joel says I confuse him when I read all these extra words, especially if I'm reading three or four scriptures. It gets confusing. So if I read one, you guys can kind of follow through. Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, do not reject or take lightly the discipline of the Lord. And the Amplified adds to it, Learn from your mistakes and the testing that comes from his correction through discipline, nor despise his rebuke. I don't like that. Do you like that? <laughs> it reminds me of going to the principal's office. I didn't go much because I was a quiet kid, but when I went, I was usually not good. You know, it, so he says. So how many of how many of you rejected discipline when your parents were going to discipline you? I did. I didn't like it, and I knew it was wrong, but it was against the point. I didn't like it. Go to your room. Don't get your toys. And all the other stuff. I didn't have much. Didn't really bother me. Send me to my room. I'm at home now. I'm good. I don't have to worry about her. Send me outside. Whatever. You know. I didn't go anywhere, so it wasn't like you keep me from going somewhere. So remember, these are all the things that he's Solomon's sticking in here to to his son. If you want wisdom, don't reject the discipline. If you want wisdom, don't take the the discipline of the Lord lightly. So yes, Lord, I know I ain't supposed to do that. I mean, we read we're reading through Solomon some of the things that we shouldn't, especially last week when we got into to the law when it told us what the curse was going to be. We were reading some of those things and we're like, okay, that one I understand. That one I, understand. I don't really about that one. I put that aside. And we were we were categorizing it in our mind. I guarantee it. You know, it's like like people do all around the world. Well, this sin's worse than that sin, but in God's going no sin, sin. You know, I think you've said it before. At some point, Harold, where. You know, we like to, well, lying isn't the same as murder. To God it is. Sin, sin. I mean, we like the God, you know, well, you're just a liar, so you're, you're okay, but you're a murderer. I don't, know, I don't want to sit next to you. Well, if God struck everybody sitting next to us down that had some sin in their life, uh, I wouldn't be sitting there either. He'd be striking me down for sometimes. I think this might be an empty room. Yeah. So thank goodness he doesn't do it. He ain't like he's going to pick the murderer out and leave the liars and the gossips. But So he's, he's saying, I do that. And then he goes on again and he follows a thread in verse 12. He says, For those whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Were you ever just like, I know my daddy loves me because he's whipping me right now. Woohoo! Yeah, daddy, whoop me with that belt. I didn't know my dad loved me when I went over to my friend's house across the street and he told me to come out of that house and get home right away and I ignored him. I, I wasn't equating that as I'm running across the field and he's faster than me because I'm just a little kid and he's got about whipping me as I'm going across the field. That was the furthest thing through my mind. My daddy loves me so much he's whipping me because I wasn't paying attention to him. But isn't it fascinating you can look back and you go, I kind of understand now. And I guarantee you, those of you who have children, understand that. Okay, I understand that. Yeah, there's sometimes you had to make that tough choice and scold your kid. You know, I don't think we'll get to it in this batch, but, you know, it always fascinates me where, where, where the scriptures and Proverbs says, no, don't despise using the rod. Well, that's whooping kids. That's just plain and simple. And, and society's trying to tell you not to beat. You know, they like to use the word beat. Spanking your kids, not beating your kid. There's a difference. To a kid, it's a beating. <laughs> yeah. So, so they can go to the school and say, "My mommy beat me." Well, she smacked me on my bottom three or four times with the belt, with the switch, with the paddle, whatever you used, the spoon, whatever it was, and they beat me. And now, in today's society, you get a phone call or a visit. It, this is a little, it's a little comical, but yet it's going back on when you reach out and do something, sometimes on the spur of the moment, like my brother, he uh, 
<laughs> my nephew was, he was probably maybe second, third grade, and he was doing something at the table where they were eating dinner, and Lester just told him to quit it, and he reached over to slap him, you know, and I don't know how he's going to slap him, but slap him on the hands or what. Kevin ducked and hit his head on the side of the table, corner of the <laughs> table. Well, it left a mark. Well, next day when he went to school, my dad they asked did him it. what happened. Mm. He said, oh, my dad my dad done it. <laughs> 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 and so social service came out to see bro oh, my brother last oh, yeah. He said he first was he was, then? Oh, yeah, wow. he said he, he said he was a little upset at first. Yeah. But he said the more he thought about it, he said, they don't know what kind of home life he has. Right. You know, it could have been he was, somebody hit him in the face, you know, right. by the eye. Right. But, I mean, we thought it was funny later, but yep. at the time, it was a little serious. But yep. Well, in the mid-80s, my brother-in-law, his kids were messing up, and they were playing in the front yard. And this is like, just like Ken Akers over here, you know, or whatever. And I don't know what his, his kid was doing, but he picked him up and spanked him right in the front yard, just with the, you know, his hand or right. over yeah. his knee or whatever. And it, everything was all good. Well, the next day, there was social services knocking mm -hmm. on his door and almost put him in jail for yeah. this because the lady across the street reported so him yeah. for spanking his kid yeah. on yeah. the bottom. Yeah. And that was in the mid-80s. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean. Yeah. So that's fascinating. So, so you, see, you don't want to you don't want to correct your kid in the supermarket. You probably yeah. might oh, not even goodness, make it out yeah. of there. Yeah. And that's that's how the enemy has got into family life, mm -hmm. trying to make it to where you can't discipline your kids. Because what's going to happen? They're going to grow up to be bad adults. Yeah. Well, it says that. Yeah. And you look at today's society. You know, you got these colleges that only want people that they agree with to come speak, and they're fussing about everybody coming, and they want their way exactly the way they're, and they're paying fifty thousand dollars plus a year to get someone to agree with them. Well, this, this instruction here, if like I was the oldest in my family, so I was usually the one in trouble first because I don't know. I you should know better. You're old enough. But what I would do. My two sisters and my brother would see what happened to me, and they would not do that. Right. So they were learning wisdom. Yeah. They were learning how to keep out of trouble because I was in trouble. The example. So, yeah. Example. Yeah. So that happens in big families. My yeah. my uh, wife, she hardly ever got spanked. Yeah. Because she had three other siblings ahead of her, and she seen what their dad was doing yeah. to them, but they weren't behaving. Yeah. So she was being on the up and up. So you gotta learn. So you gotta look at he's he sandwiched this. <coughs> In between health in your body, and now he's going to go into another subject. He just puts it right in the middle. You know, we could I could have went through scriptures and got all kinds of things and instruction, and I just didn't feel that that's where God wanted to go. I think he wants to go in this next chunk of scripture because there's, there's several of them on the same topic after that. But I just thought that was fascinating that the Holy Spirit inspired, you know, Solomon to write this. Because the whole book, he's like, son, if you listen to me, son, if you listen to me, I'm getting ready. I've done said something you should really pay attention to. Help in your body if you do what God tells you. And now he's going down to something else. So let's see what he's doing. And in Proverbs 13, he says, Happy, blessed, considerate, fortunate to be admired is the man who finds skillful and godly wisdom. And the man who gains understanding and insight, learning from God's word and life's experiences. And that kind of ties in with what Harold just said. If you learn, if I say this, I get in trouble. If I do this, I get in trouble. So I need to adjust my ways. And that's what Solomon's saying. He says, we should be constantly growing to be more and more like Christ, the renewing the mind that we talk about all the time. And if we do that, and he's saying, we should be blessed. Mine says happy. And then it says blessed, considered fortunate to be admired. I mean, I'm sure they probably didn't think about it, but Harold's Harold's uh, brothers and sisters are probably going, man, I'm so glad you were the bad one because you showed us exactly what not to do. So whenever something happened, we made it look just like you did it, and we never got in trouble. <laughs> so it's like... You were an example. <laughs> you know, and then that's the way it is. And see, Christ is our example on how to live so that we can be happy, so that we can be blessed, we can be considered fortunate... And I love the next one, to be admired. Is there people throughout 
your jobs, your lives, your, your family, that whether they would admit it or not, Admire your walk with God. And see, sometimes admiring your walk with God is when they test you. I like my, my favorite line is I thought you were a, I thought you were a Christian. Well, obviously you're seeing something in me that you you were saying, okay, that's different, and now you're just like, I'm gonna beat on him about this because he's different. And whether it's right or wrong, very rarely are they right, but once in a while, got me. And he goes on. And the man who gains understanding. So now he's telling us how to be blessed and considered and considered fortunate. You're gaining understanding and insight. And the Amplified says, learning from God's word and life's experiences. Are we constantly growing or are we staying the same? If you put a, if you put a glass of water and then you have a, a little river trickling down that has constant flow, doesn't matter how big it is or how small it is, if it has constant water, which one's going to go stagnant? That glass of water. Because it doesn't have a fresh source coming into it. See, that river is washing away the bad and bringing new nutrients. And there's certain animals that won't live in that stagnant pool, but they find them a river of fresh water. And there's other critters that want the stagnant, nasty water. But, the, but it's fascinating. Are we constantly letting the living water flow into so it can flow out of? And see, that's the way to think of it. Everything we're getting feels like it's for us at the moment, and sometimes it is, but it's also for someone else. All the life experiences that we lived is not just for us, it's for someone else. Because there's certain situations that you've all went through that can relate to someone that I'll never go through. But you have that witness to someone else. And that's to, be, that's to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you. So when that situation happens, you can go, I know exactly how you feel. I don't know what you personally feel, but I know how you feel. Because I've been through it and, and I've gone through it. And it was fascinating to me. And he just keeps he keeps piling on to that same thing. In verse 14 he says, For wisdom's profit is better than the profit of silver, and her gain is better than fine gold. We dig into the word of God, it's better than money. Because God's already told us in different scriptures, I will take care of you. If he, has, if he has the ultimate knowledge, he can give us the wisdom to make whatever resources we need. He can supernaturally provide resources and, and miracles at times, but he can also give us the wisdom to create those resources. Because it profits better than gold and better than silver. He keeps going. She is more precious than rubies, and nothing you can wish for compares to her. Wisdom, God's wisdom, there's nothing in this world that compares to it. I'm pretty sure each of you, in an example, you could be sitting there, I don't know what to do, and boom, a thought pops in your head. And at first you might, well, that's stupid, that's crazy, I don't wonder, that has nothing to do with it. And then as you start thinking and as you start meditating and you start, God, what am I going to do? He starts going, remember that thought you said was stupid? Listen to me. And it starts to take form and you start to receive and you're like, okay, I understand that. I need to call that person and tell them this because they're the answer to that part and the friends they know is the answer to that part. Okay, God, I see the thread you're weaving now. And we don't always see the thread. But it's like, I don't know why I'm supposed to call so-and-so or I don't know why I'm supposed to do just this. This little piece. If you had $100 and you had a million dollar bill, that you had to pay. How does God tell you to pay that bill? Start now. Says so, right? So if you gave your hundred dollars, would it make a difference in your million dollar bill? No. Put your effort. So so it's like Mary's got a hundred dollar need. Here's my hundred bucks. It ain't doing nothing in my million dollar need, but it's going to bless her socks off. And then next thing you know, down the road, somehow God goes, well, we got that reduced, or we got that changed, or we got this different. And in different ways, God starts blessing you. And you're like, well, 
It's almost that he blessed me more from nothing than he blessed me when I had the hundred and I was holding tight. Got to keep this hundred. It was fascinating. I went to the auction yesterday and picked up a few things, and and I paid them. And from what I made Friday, uh, I had seven sales Friday at the sale, but two of them I kind of made money, but I didn't because I sold a lot of stuff to make a good chunk of money. And and it was like so I paid for the stuff I bought, and, and I had a had a twenty dollar bill in my in my hand. I said. Praise God, this twenty dollar bill is gonna last me the rest of the rest of the month. And remember, what was yesterday the first? <laughs> and what what's the you know, and and it just came out natural, so I don't know, I, I can't even say I meant it. But I should have, because that's what Christ would have meant. I'll get you through. I know Tuesday I'm gonna make more, so I'll get you through. But I but I spoke that and I was like, I do believe that. Because God has never let me go without... And I'm starting to say quarters instead of nickels. God has never let me go without quarters when I need them. I don't have millions, but I got 50 cents when I need 50 cents. I believe that to the core. And and a couple of guys goes up there and says, Well, I guess if you don't eat... Okay, whatever you guys can, you can guys can see the natural, you know. And, and I didn't even realize I, I wasn't doing it as a spiritual lesson to them or a spiritual lesson to myself. It was just at the moment when I left and got everything loaded up, the Holy Spirit started working with me. He says, "Do you truly believe that I can get you through this month with what you got in your pocket?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I do." Because you gave me seed of what I bought, so I know Tuesday I can go plant that seed on that table, and somebody hopefully will give me something else, and it will go. I put seed in my eBay store from other seeds that I bought stuff, so I got seeds in the ground. I'm just like, Lord, you just need to water them and prosper them. So I do believe that. Now other people look at me, you ain't got nothing, and they're right. But still, I've always had that fifty cents when I needed it. So it's fascinating. And he goes on. He says, long life is her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Long life is her right hand. Wisdom gives you long life. I don't listen to this well, but wisdom will tell me what to eat and how much of it. But those potato chips and that dip that I had yesterday was pretty good. So I'm pretty sure I wasn't listening to the wisdom, which is the Holy Spirit, and saying, you know, three or four chips or whatever it was supposed to be is pretty good, but that bag and that chips are good. (laughs) You know, and it's like Lay's, can't just eat one. Or, you know, you should drink more water and less soda. I've got that one down a little bit. I don't really like soda. I go to sweet tea now because that's a little better for me. But, Wisdom will give us long life. It will it will help us to grow more vegetables so that we'll eat them instead of junk food. It will help us change our diets. It will help us change our lifestyle. It will help us change things that need to be changed because the Holy Spirit is constantly renewing us to be more like Jesus. And he says he'll give you long life. Now the fascinating thing is if you put that in context if you put okay if the power of life and death is in my tongue and you put it with that one the long life depends on what you're speaking because long life to someone might be 30 years <coughs> because they speak that every one of my family dies when they're 35 I've got and I'm hit 30 and oh my gosh 35 I'll have this person's all had heart attacks. These person all died. These people had accidents and job, but they're constantly speaking. And what usually happens? That thread keeps going in their generation. But you put in there what we speak. Isn't it fascinating what we speak? Long life in our right hand. It it'll lead and guide you and change and transform you to go. Well, maybe I don't want to be a coal miner all my life. Maybe I ought to go get a different job, you know, or something, you know, because being in that coal mine, whatever. That life situation, whatever, in her left hand are riches and honor. Wisdom, riches and honor. Well, we talked a little bit about the money, the financial part of God doing it. But do you ever think about honor? You have honor. Why do you have honor? Because you're an ambassador of Christ. 
You live like Christ. You talk like Christ. You act like Christ. You have an, you're an ambassador of Christ. Morning. And, and that's, that's why you have honor. There's situations. There's changes. There's things that happen. And he goes on. In verse 17, Her ways are highways of pleasantness and favor, and all her paths are peace. Okay. I'm starting to grasp the peace thing. So I understand when I don't have peace about something, I'm off. And that's hard. You know, her ways are highways of pleasantness and peace. The wisdom of God is highways of pleasantness. I'm not always pleasant. That's just an attitude thing. So I know, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm not listening to you. <laughs> I'm like, huh. You my, my, remember the little hands? You got the you got the angel and the devil up here, the cartoon. I don't know about you, when I'm driving down the road, that little red guy on my shoulder really likes to try to speak through me, and sometimes I let him. <laughs> what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, not supposed to be that. <laughs> don't you know how to use your turn signal? You just went that way, and it's going that way. Come on. And, and I have those little things. And the the pleasantness. There's there's a this there's a look everything Jesus went through the pain the turmoil the the struggle but can't you can't you see the the as you're reading scriptures and and even the the good plays and the good good movies and the good little skits can't you see the pleasant in Jesus' face as he was going through this week. There was a pleasantness about Jesus. We get, we get today. He's riding on the donkey. He's going. He's getting ready to go in town. Everybody's praising and worship. But somehow, some way, he had a pleasantness about him when he was getting whipped, when he was hanging on the cross, when he was coming out of that grave. And if we stub our toe, I'm not very pleasant. If we have a little minor thing, I'm not very pleasant. So the renewing of our mind we talk about. And he goes on. And he says, and favor. Favor. The wisdom of God gives you pleasantness and favor. There's stories after stories of, I've heard different people where, where they need to do certain things. And you know, the, the red tape that gets in the way. And the Holy Spirit starts talking to them. And they're like, it's been two years. I'm trying to get this project done. I'm trying to get this done or whatever the red tape is. And all of a sudden, the knocking. Did you ask me to help you? Did, did, you, did you talk to me about, you know, are you, are you going to let me do anything in this? Or are you just trying to do it all in your own strength? Or I got to talk to this congressman or, or this senator or, or this person's in charge. If I can only talk to them and if I can remind them what I did for their great, great granny or this, that, and the other. Or, you know. And you, did you ask the Holy Spirit to take care of the situation? And that's, and we talked about it with, with, with sickness and healing and, and, and finances and all the, all the big stuff. But the Holy Spirit says, am I your first recourse or am I your last attempt at getting something done? We forget that. I forget that. I go through life and be like, okay, well, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got I to gotta, I gotta go do this so that I get money, or you know, oh, sniffles. I better get my cold medicine instead of going. Holy Spirit, what 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 does your word say in this situation? God, God, what do you, what do you want me to do? Is my first recourse to go to God, or is my first recourse to go to man? And in that that red tape situation, is it our first recourse to go? Lord, did you ask me to do this? Yes. Then that obstacle shouldn't be there. There, there's. Is there something I need to do different? Is the enemy fighting? How do I pray through this? How do I release it to you and let you take care of it? And that's hard. You know, that's hard. It's hard for us to release a situation and say, you take care of it. I don't want to... You, I'm, I'm your kid. You know, you told me, Lord, that I am your child. I am a son or a daughter of God. And as a prince or princess, you are the king of all kings. You have all authority over everything. You need to change this. And you watch him work. But sometimes we just got to listen. He's like, I'll change it, but I need you to make this phone call. This crazy thing that you never thought about? You know, you know you're know, you trying to make a building and, 
you know, I need you to go to the rec department. What, what's that got to do with the building? You just need to go talk to so-and-so. That makes no sense to me. So you go talk to this person and says, that sounds like a great idea. Let me call my uncle that's in charge. And the uncle may never even saw your paperwork because of the red tape. Someone all way under him. The secretary's like, ah, we don't need that. Or, oh, nope. Nah. I remember Uncle Fred don't like that person. We'll sit it at the bottom of the stack. And we don't know what the enemy's doing in people's minds and playing games. It's just fascinating. The favor and all her paths are peace. Do we always have peace? No. And when we're not at peace, that's a very clear sign that we're, we're missing something. And in different ways, you know what that feels like. I can't explain it to you what that peace, that inner peace. And the, the best example I've ever had of that, that peace that surpasses all understanding that, God, that, that Jesus talks about is when my mom passed away. And Sunday morning, and I remember going into the office with Miss Dot there, and I said, I'm going to sit in the back row, Miss Dot, if someone calls and tells me my mom passed away, just come and tap me on the shoulder. You ain't got to say anything, so we disrupt the service. And, and, and I'll know what you're talking about. Well, it didn't happen Sunday morning. So I go to my grandparents, and I go to sleep on the couch after I eat all the feast that my grandmother made for me, feeding an army, and it's just me, her, and my grandfather. And my aunt comes over, and I knew as soon as she walked through the door that she'd got the phone call. But something happened between the time I came because we still had Sunday night service. I come in there and I'm standing there letting people come in and out. And I had such a peace. And people, because at that time they knew. And I was like, my mom, you know, they pulled the plug and she passed away this afternoon. Well, how are you doing? I said, I have, I have a peace that I cannot explain. And that, that's how I understood what Christ was said, the peace that surpasses all understanding. And that's the wisdom of God. He keeps going. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. And happy, and Amplified says, blessed, considered fortunate, to be admired, is everyone who holds tight to her. He reinforces that. He said that earlier, right? The Lord by his wisdom has founded the earth, and by his understanding he established the heavens. Verse 20, by his knowledge, the deeps were broken up and the clouds, the drip with dew. 21, my son, let them not escape from your sight, but keep sound wisdom and discretion and they will be life to your soul, your inner self and a gracious adornment of your neck, your, your outer self. Verse 23, then you will walk on your way of life securely and your foot will not stubble, stumble. If we recognize God, and everything he's done before us. This is all just on wisdom. It's all on wisdom. It's and grasping wisdom. Wisdom yeah. holding on to it. So if, and it's fascinating. It says, then you will walk on your way securely. And your foot will not stumble. So the next one is, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. So yeah. if you lie down, you are afraid. Yeah, the next you're not, one. You're not grabbing much wisdom. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about the next one pretty good. But mm -hmm. I remember one time I, I was either late 20s or early, or early 30s. And I was walking across the yard. And I stepped in a hole. And I felt it in my back. Didn't think nothing of it. Well, I had to be to work in a couple hours. So I laid down on the bed. I don't know if I was taking a nap or what. But I could not move when I woke up and I was like oh my goodness I rolled out on all fours and painfully got through it because my back was in tor terrible and then I finally got to work and I'm and we had high chairs like a bar stool because we had Western Union and, and we were up three or four feet and the people we looked down because the people were there about their 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 head was about that so, and I'm sitting on this stool I couldn't have sat in a real chair and I wasn't walking around that's for sure and I'm sitting on this stool and the boss's wife comes in and goes, you don't look good. I said, I'm in terrible pain. Because I stepped in a hole. I stumbled into a hole. It wasn't like I tried to lift something. I just stepped in the wrong place. So I kind of understand what it means to stumble. Now you put that in other aspects of your life, and you can put an example to where you stumbled and the consequences have came to you. I've stumbled spiritually and the consequences have come to me. 
I've stumbled in the natural and did stuff I shouldn't have done and the consequences have come to me. But he says, your foot won't stumble. 24, as Harold was going. I love this one. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. You ever get afraid? You've been afraid. And I'm not talking afraid of the snake. Or afraid of the neighbor's dog. Or afraid of what, you know, a natural thing. I'm afraid of heights. A roller coaster, I get on it and I laugh my whole way up. I'm scared, but I'm laughing my whole way up just because I'm covering the fear. And then it's fun. I'm talking, so I get on top of a roof. I don't mind going up. I just don't like that first step coming down. I'm afraid to take the first step. I get up there and do some things. I'm not getting up on a two-story roof. I'm not that, you know, I just don't like heights. You know, and, but have you ever been afraid of a situation have you ever been afraid if I make this choice, what's going to happen? Have you ever been afraid of, well, if I tell them exactly how I feel, what are they going to say to me? If I, if, I, if I make this decision, I know this is going to happen, and oh my goodness. What if, what if I make this decision and, and, you're, and it ruins my business? What if I make this decision and it ruins my marriage? What if I, if I say what God says and it... Have you ever been afraid? Wisdom tells us there's a disconnect somewhere. There's a renewed mind that's not happened there somewhere. Because we can go to the Word of God and have clarity on any decision we need to make. We may not feel easy about it, but we can go, Father, you say this, so if I have to make this tough decision, you're in charge of the consequences. And remember, remember the story? Well, if... If the kids are bad and you kick them out of church, what's going to happen? And and I, I used to have it all the time from from the from the the people at church. What what do you mean you kicked them out for a week? They were being disrespectful. They were being bad. Well, what if they never come back? I said they're in God's hands. I trust God. Do you? That's the hard part. Remember, I said I've never had one kid not come back. Whoa. Well, that one I kicked out three times. You ain't coming back unless your mom calls. Knowing her mom was in witchcraft and everything else and that wanted nothing to do with the church, or I get a phone call. Remember the phone's hanging up right over there? It used to. Hey, hello? Well, I'm so-and-so's mother. I just I just want to ask. My daughter wants to know if she can come back. And I explained the situation. She said, okay, you were good. That's great. Okay. I said, if, you know, if she does it again, she's going to have to have you call again. And she came back, and she was good after that because she understood the consequences. But are we afraid of certain decisions we make? If I do this, what's going to happen? Remember he's talked about peace when having wisdom of God. We should have peace. If we're afraid of a decision, either, either something is amiss. Maybe it wasn't the right decision. Maybe it was not trusting God. I don't know. It's your decision. You know why you're afraid. I like this one. When you lie down, and this is lying down. This is like when you're going to bed. You know, when you lie down. I don't know about you, but what happens when I lie? It hasn't happened since I picked this up many years ago. And I used to, every time I went to bed, my mind would sit there and go, chugga, 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 spitting and spitting and spitting and spitting. I'm like, I literally tell myself, shut up. I want to go to sleep. But mind, hour after hour after hour. Or maybe I'd get a little nap. You know, I'm, I'm going to bed so I can sleep through the night and I get a little nap and then my mind wakes up, wakes me up and starts going, chugga, 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 chugga. I said, I just fell asleep. Why are you doing this? And I literally would have to start saying every night, Lord, your scripture says when I lie down, my sweet should be, my sleep should be sweet, restful. Other scripture says our sleep should be restful. And I would have to say it. And it took a while. Eventually I started to be able to do it. So I don't have that happening all the time. Well, if the, if the enemy's play field is our mind, if he can get you not to sleep, he can get you to make bad decisions because you're not thinking clearly. So not only do we fight our own thoughts, we got to fight the enemy going, because he likes to throw coal in that choo-choo engine. Uh, let's keep throwing coal in Mary's engine. 
and get her thinking. That's like David Jeremiah said this morning, the devil does not make an appointment with you. Yeah. He doesn't say, Ivan, I'm going to call you at 3 o'clock. That's right. And we're going to have, he's, he comes and sneaks yeah. in whenever yeah. he can to get yeah. get to you at the weakest time, mm-hmm. maybe. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. I mean, you think about it. If you haven't rested well and you have, an, you have like a, a, a presentation or something that you got to give, or if, if you got to teach or something, or if you if you're trying to instruct something, and you're going, this is what you do, and you're not thinking clearly because your mind's thinking, boy, I wish I had got some more sleep, or I should have done that. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. See, it comes down to, I I had to do it a lot. I mean, it's like minute after minute. 10 minutes after 10 minutes but eventually it got to where my mind got renewed and like you know what Lord my, my mind's trying to churn here I need to go to sleep I gotta go to work tomorrow I wanna get up in the morning I wanna be well rested do whatever I want you know and isn't it fascinating at least to me it happened a lot on Saturday night just sat Saturday night really was a bad day. It was like chugga 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 chugga. And, and even back then, what did I usually do on Saturday, Sunday morning? Well, I had I had a Bible study I had to teach. Well, I had to get up early to come to church because maybe I was serving at the earlier service or I was doing this. And it was like, so much easier if I was tired to keep you know. At least I had something to draw me. I was like. Well, I got to get up because people are expecting me to be there and to say something. Oh, maybe to be good, maybe it won't, but I'm gonna give them something. But what if you didn't have that commitment? I was committed to coming, whether I felt like it or not. But what if you didn't have the commitment? How easy is it to go? Well, I ain't got to teach. No, I can just get up and come to such and such, or well, that's one Sunday out of the month. You know, I just you know, and the mind says, I slept. I'm just gonna sleep in this week. But I don't know about you. Remember when I skipped one day of school and it always turned into about a week? <laughs> Once I skipped one, it was easy not to go to the next one. And that's what the enemy does. Good. Uh, well, I was thinking about the trip across the lake, you know, when the storm threw up. Yep, yep. And Jesus is asleep in the boat. Yeah. And that uh, how we strive to have the Spirit of the Lord, you know, so we can sleep like that in the midst of these storms. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, whether it's like we had last night, right? Well, yeah. I mean, that was some kind of storm. Right. Right. Jesus, right. 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 Jesus is sleeping, and when the disciples were panicking, he, he said, hey, you know, be calm. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he was never upset. No. You know, he was always able to sleep through situations like that. And yeah. If we have the Spirit of the Lord with us, mm-hmm. um, you know, perhaps we don't have, we don't have that perfect peace. But right. We have certainly have that spirit we can I think you know, Jesus is leaving it in the hands of the Lord right I mean yeah. in, the, in the hands of God you yeah can, you know you trust God and yeah well, if we have that trust it. Yeah. you got you're at least in one situation what did he tell the disciples he said go to the other side as soon as he said that if they had if they had the pure faith of the Holy Spirit at once they had once he was crucified they'd be like I don't care what the storm is. He said, I'm getting to the other side. Look at Paul. Paul was in a ship going to Rome to be, we know, killed. He also, Paul knew that the Holy Spirit told him, you will not die until you stand before Caesar. And look at all the stuff that happened to him. Paul had an understanding. And then when the, when the, when the crowds came up, we're going to stone you to death. You may stone me, but you can't kill me. And I'll, and he didn't take it air. I don't know if it was me. I'd be like, "Yeah, you can't kill me while I'm getting pummeled." No, and I did. I'm either either going to raise me from the dead. One situation there was kind of like we don't know if they did or not, but it was close enough. And it was like he gets up and goes back in town again. But Jesus told those guys on the boat, "Go to the other side." So as soon as Jesus spoke it, everything Jesus spoke was truth. If they had the Holy Spirit the way they did after the resurrection, it should have been natural to them, like. You can do whatever you want. This boat's getting to the other side, whether we're rowing or it just shows up there as when he wakes up or not. And then what did he say? 
Jesus said, you have little faith. I told you to get to the other side. So you, any obstacle, remember the mountains when I said get, mountain get? So if they, if they understood that after the way they did after he was resurrected, then they should have got up and go, we're getting to the other side whether you're here or not, wind. But they should have said, wind, stop. Because we're rowing. Tell we're rowing and we're getting nowhere. We want to row to get somewhere. But Paul, he says, he says, you know my jailers? Uh, you take these chains off of me and don't throw any person over. Because they were going to throw the prisoners over. Don't throw any of the prisoners over. My God says we will all live. Now I don't know about you in the natural. What they're probably thinking is, cool, we're going to get through this. The boat's going to survive. What happened to the boat? Got destroyed. They all end up on the island. None of them died. Now I, I, I don't know what Paul's human nature was, but I know his spirit nature was like, you can't kill me. The boat's going to fall apart. I'm not going to drown. I don't care if these are on my. I don't care if my feet are somehow. You know, I don't. I don't know if there's dolphins or dolphins in there. But it can, like, you know, you hear the stories of dolphins rescuing people. I don't know if they're in that sea or not. But I can see Paul going, "Yeah, the dolphins will get me." If 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 the whale that we say a whale, if the whale swallowed Jonah and spit him out where he's supposed to go, God can do that for me. Peace. Is our mountain bigger than our God? And that's all the enemy wants to do. If the power of life and death is in our tongue, there's certain people that rehearse their bad situations over and over and over, and that first phone call they make to their gossip friend is, do you know how bad it is? And they say it, and they say it, and they'll be on the phone 23 out of the 24 hours and that's all they're talking. Life is terrible. This hurts and that's terrible and this is happening. Their life and death is in my tongue so I am propping up my mountain over my God. And it's hard, isn't it? Where's, you know, where's that fine line? Where's that fine line? That's between you and God. But where's that fine line? Am I talking my mountain or am I giving information? Am I... Am I, am I Trying to gain some godly wisdom from someone else? Where's the fine line between speaking to speaking a situation? Because honestly, Scripture even tells us our situation isn't the truth. It's just a fact. The facts are God's got it in control. Even though it doesn't look that way in the natural, if we go to Scripture. And that's hard. Where is that fine line? Do not be afraid. Twenty-five. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the storm of the wicked when it comes, since you will be blameless. It's funny. It goes to the storm. Don't be, don't be afraid of sudden fear. Verse twenty-six. For the Lord will be your confidence, your firm and strong, and will keep your foot from being caught. And the amplified says, "Put in a trap." It's right there. Where's your confidence like? See, and I've said it a bunch of times. There's, there's situations that I grasp. Money I grasp. I don't have a lot, but God will give me 50 cents when I need it. And sometimes 50 cents is all I got, which freaks people out. You looked at my bank account, there is nothing in it. And it freaks people out. How do you do this? How do you do that? Well, I trust God to give me 50 cents when I need 50 cents. And he's never let me down. Health. I don't get sniffles. I don't get none of that. I just look at it. I, I, I've understood scripture. By his stripes, I was healed. I get it. But I've saturated myself in it. And I got it. And there's things you got that I don't. But as we saturate ourselves, we start to get that. I got confidence in my God. I will always have 50 cents when I need it. And I just won't get sick. I, I just, that's two things I have confidence. When, you know, when he says, I'll have peaceful sleep. I've learned to get that. But it's renewing my mind. Who do I listen to? You know, be firm. For your Lord will be your confidence, firm and strong. If I'm a child of the king, that makes me a prince or a princess of the king. He also tells me that I am ambassador of Christ. He also tells me that I am co-heirs with Christ so everything Christ has I have if Christ did it 
I should do it. I ain't renewed my mind on that one yet because I sure ain't raised no one from the dead. I've had a few people get rid of some sniffles. I ain't had no major healings happen. But I've prayed for some things and God's done. It's kind of cool. But I'm working on it. It's, I, I, that's who I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be Christ. Remember the Holy Spirit. The Spirit living within us is 100% like Christ. We got to let him out. My flesh gets in the way. Because my mind ain't been renewed and I start fearing. I don't have the sweet rest and I don't have the confidence in the situation. Well, keep your foot from being caught in a trap. Who's laying the trap? The enemy wants to trap us every time we get around. You start to gain, you know, you start to gain a seed of the word of God that's been planted in your life. And somehow, some way, that person you may not have talked to in six years calls you up and whatever that seed has been planted they're going through a situation that is just beating it down and you're like well, maybe that ain't true because look what they're going through or maybe that ain't true they're saying this verse 27 do not withhold good from those to whom it is due its rightful recipient when it is in your power to do it wow Remember the, the store we used? Well, if Mary had a million dollar bill and she only had $100 and she found out that the other Mary has a $100 bill and it would wipe her out, that 100 bucks on your million isn't going to mean nothing. She gives it to Mary. Mary's wiped out and then all of a sudden doors and avenues and reductions in the bill start to happen for Mary because I can meet a $100 need. I can't meet a million dollar need, but here, ain't doing me any good. But we hold tight. It's mine. I need that hundred dollars because maybe I can turn it into hundred and one. And then that way I can I'll be able to get one dollar closer. I wonder. You know, Pastor talks about them laying down their cloaks and laying down the palm leaves today in the message. But I wonder how many cloaks we've held so tight to. You can see your fingerprints in them that should have been laid down. Now, I'm not just talking about what we need to get rid of, what we need to change, what the, the attitudes that we have. And I'm talking about stuff, your time, your resources. I mean, what do we hold to? Well, you know, if I do this, I won't be able to do that. So, you know, it's my time. I'm busy. I'm busy. Or, well, there's resources. Well, if I give them that, that's my last one. What will happen? cloak hold on to did Jesus hold on to anything he's friends freely I give it's hard it's hard you got a dollar in your pocket and you know you know and you know the Holy Spirit saying give that last dollar well, that last dollar is going to buy me at least a drink today I might not eat but at least I could have got a soda somewhere <laughs> I think of it this way if, you're, if your hand is closed because you're hanging on to things so tight yeah you can't receive it till you open your hand. Yeah. So yeah. if you give it, you can get it back. Yeah. But if you keep it closed, how can the Lord give That's it right. to you? right. You know, the law of sowing and reaping. Yeah. He says, how do you get something you want? You sow the same thing. If you want love, sow love. You want happiness, sow happiness. You want money, sow money. If you need, if you need health, pray for the health of other people. Sow what you want. Are we sowing? You know, Say, you know, yep, not going there. I'll keep that one to myself. So uh, these folks throwing their cloaks down on the road. Yeah. I mean, uh, we all got cloaks on right now. Yeah. I mean, uh, with, you know, and the donkey's coming. I mean, yeah. and, uh, it's going to clomp on now. It's yeah. Like, might even ruin it. Yeah, yeah. probably yeah. go to the bathroom on it to be nice. <laughs> so that was a, really a... It was a sacrifice. Of, yeah. Yeah, it was an act of selflessness. Yeah. But they were focused on what? They were, but at the same time, and I know he's going to say it, so hopefully don't. it's not a spoiler alert, hopefully, when you go into the service. A lot of those people picked those cloaks up. They, they, in that same sacrificial moment, were the same people within several days are going to be yelling, crucify him. And see... It's the nation of Israel. 
is such a very powerful example to us of at least myself of who I am. Yeah, right. Yeah. I love you, love you, love you, love you. <laughs> I don't want no more quail. Give me something else. I'm tired of it. And I gotta wander. And we're all doing it. The same way with those people. The whole nation of Israel. Those people, the Pharisees were the religious of the religious. They knew all the prophecies. And they they had to put them away. Where was he born? Okay, there's one. So okay, it's starting off good. Where was he raised? Up oh, up there. That's two. That's up. Oh, that's two. That's pretty good. They probably could get the a handful of them and they should have known. But they allowed their way to get in the way. If I say this, if I if, if, if I release this power onto the true Messiah, I, I can't tell the people what to do. They won't praise me no more because they'll be praising the true king. You know, if I if I throw my only coat down, you know, it's pretty cold and windy, you know. It's you know, let's just assume they had the same weather they had today. Well, it is a you know, if I throw my only coat down, I'm gonna freeze the rest of the week. You know, Jesus, I love you, but you know, that's my only coat. And you know how long I had to work for that coat? Gra- granny gave me that coat, and I'm how dare you ask for granny's coat. Well, you think they left their coats there? I think it's just all out of adulation, you know, praising him for being the king. Yeah. yeah. What, what, a, what a ritual that is, though. I, I mean, I guess I'd have to research why yeah. people threw their coats. But. Yeah. Because they were recognizing him as a king, because that's what they did when the kings came through. They were just, that's just their way of, that's, that's the only thing they could do. They didn't have money to give the king, real good presents, but I can make sure your donkey don't step in a mud puddle, he steps oat. Oh, He's still yeah, stepping in the mud carpet. Part. Yeah, that's kind yeah, of their red exactly carpet. Exactly, like, just like when the president comes or whatever. Yeah. You know, they have the long parade. Yeah. And it's the same kind of thing. It's just yeah. it's just scaled to what they have around them. Yeah, but it's like you said earlier, though. That coat's getting ruined. Right. That donkey. That donkey's yeah. stepping on that coat. And we. How many people? How long? How long are you going to stand there? Because you know the people were following Jesus just like a parade. So how many? Hundreds, thousands of people stepped on your coat before you waited to the end of the line, if you did, to get it. It, was, it most likely was ruined. Imagine, because you know what happens if you step in a pebble and, you, and it's in your shoe for today. You know, the sock's usually done. Your foot's done for sure. It's like, man, that little, that little teeny pebble. But thousands of people were walking on this. And... You know, the donkey had to probably go somewhere. I'm, I'm an Amish country. So it still amazes me to the no end that you see the horse going down and how how he can walk and go at the same time. I'm like, you're better than I am because I, I want to sit there for three or four hours and think of nothing. And, you know, I was like, well, I guess I better go now so I can get out of here. You know, <laughs> you know I need to go. You know, and they, you know, the donkey's doing it. And we don't know if there was other animals, but we know there's people, a very big crowd of people. I think they were so focused on who it was and what was going on that they didn't even care about their people. Probably not. They probably had a genuine, heartfelt worship moment. But how quickly they forgot. That's the same guy I gave Granny's coat for. Yeah, that was like a crowd mentality there because yeah. the Pharisees stirred that up and then everybody just went along with it. Oh. So I could go both ways. If I get enough frenzy, I can get you to intellectually say Jesus if I was smart enough to come with all your with all the excuses you had. I could I could make a threat to intellectually get you to a right answer, but still your hearts never change. So obviously they had a right answer. Someone says this is the Messiah. I love them. Oh, I got to love the Messiah. But someone also turns around. If it was an intellectual, you can take an intellectual argument and change it. If someone's smarter than you, well, out then maybe that ain't the Messiah. Crucify him. Oh. That's scary, and that there's gonna there's gonna be a lot of people sitting in churches around the world. You know, we'll just we'll just use next week because a lot of people are gonna come to church. Don't let me come to church next week. They have an intellectual knowledge that they know they should be there Easter and Christmas, and then they forget about it 
six months until six months later, I got to go to Easter service. I got to go to Christmas. I'm going to close because I'm, I'm way past. Um, your wife's here, so you don't have to leave. So I've seen her walking around. Um, and it's fascinating to me. This is the, I was praying this morning, and this is what God was, was laying on my heart. It's like, there's so many people out there that are so excited about an egg or a bunny. <laughs> but they're not ex- excited about the Christ. And there's a lot of people sitting in churches around the world that equate this, that, or the other with Christ that has nothing to do with Christ. And they're missing worshiping Christ himself. Because they're expecting this to be, oh, if, I, if, if, if this place does that, that's where Christ obviously has to be because of this, that, or the other. It has nothing to do with what we do or don't do. It has everything to do with who we worship. And we, I'll close on that. So, let, bye, Debbie. <laughs>